O oh God of love, we come together in this beloved community to seek your wisdom through your holy word and your presence with us here today. Help us, we pray, to hear what you want to say to us this morning. Guide us, we pray, in gaining greater understanding of you and your ways for ourselves and all people. Amen. Amen. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus tells his listeners that they must repent. When I was a child, during the season of Lent, repentance seemed like a kind of a melancholy time. It was a time of year when we focused on um, how sinful we were. When I was a child, a lot of the concepts that I was taught didn't necessarily make a great deal of sense to me, but I knew that I was supposed to believe them. As an adult, I am grateful to the theologian and scholar Marcus Borg. He gives me a more life-giving way to look at Lent and the concept of repentance. Borg points out that the meaning of repentance is rooted in the idea of exile and, re and moving out of exile. Repentance is then the journey out of exile to reconnect with God. It, it is about dying to an old way of being and being born into a new way of being. For me, that is a much more life-giving way to enjoy the season of Lent. Borg says this is a path of transformation, going from the mind that is shaped by culture and into the mind of Christ. Rather than dwelling on the idea that I am a bad or unworthy person, Repentance becomes the journey out of exile and into the realm of God. Everyone can feel in exile sometimes. We all get off track. We all lose our focus. But there is always the invitation to return to God. For me, thinking about these, re these ideas of reconnecting with the divine for transformation and renewal make the season of Lent life-giving and inviting. Jesus also shares a parable about a gardener who is open to future possibilities. The gardener vows to, cut, to tend to the fig tree, even though the owner of the vineyard wanted to cut it down. He wants to nurture the soil, put manure, and see if he can get life to flourish again. The parable is left open-ended so that we can enter into the story and see ourselves in it. When Paul and I moved to our house in Redlands about 16 years ago, there were several sort of scraggly rose bushes in the backyard, and I don't have a green thumb, so I admit that I pretty much have always ignored those bushes. But last spring, a, bit, a bright green shoot came out of one of those bushes that had no scent. And there was a beautiful big pink rose on it. And this pink rose had a glorious scent. So now, like the gardener in the parable, I'm interested. <laughs> so I put plant food, I, I dug around and I put some plant food. And every day I'd bring out coffee grounds and I'd look at the, I peer into the leaves looking for signs of life. Today at our special women's service, we can remember some fearless women who have faithfully nurtured seeds of peace and freedom. One such woman is Malala Yosufa. Yosufa, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> Malala. When Malala was 11, a British news organization, the BBC, wanted to find a local schoolgirl in Pakistan to write about what it was like to live under an extremist re regime. They reached out to Malala's father, who was a teacher. He knew that it would be dangerous, but Malala overheard the conversation. She wanted to do it. Why not me? Malala wanted to speak up for herself and for the girls in her community. Malala's diary was published on the BBC website for 10 weeks, and people all over the world read her story. This brought Malala a lot of respect and fame, but it also made her a target. 
A gunman found her on a school bus. The Taliban had sent an assassin. They managed to shoot her, but they didn't manage to kill her or her spirit. Malala urges the world, she urges world leaders to invest in books, not bombs. The Malala Fund is opening schools all around the world. In her Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, she dedicated the award to all the girls who cannot attend school. Malala uses her voice as a powerful tool to bring transformation and greater understanding among people. She is like a master gardener, tending seeds of peace and justice. Our psalm today speaks of joy and delight in God. God takes the small and changes the world with it. The Holy One works with our desire and thirst for God and helps us to cultivate it and grow it. With God's help, ordinary people can do amazing things. Wangari Mathai is one such woman who accomplished amazing things in her home country of Kenya, in East Africa. After becoming the first East African woman to earn a PhD, Wangari became a professor in her home of Kenya. She raised three children and was active in international women's rights and environmental organizations. She was also upset about the problems that plagued her country. The Kenya of 1970 was not the Kenya of her childhood. The population had grown, and forests were being cut down to make way for cash crops like coffee and tea. Poverty, unemployment, and malnutrition were on the rise. And Wangari believed the root cause was environmental destruction. As forests were being destroyed for profit, rural communities suffered. And Wangari knew that women suffered the most. They were the primary caretakers. And they had great responsibility for tilling the land, planting the food, and feeding the families. Her beautiful country was on the verge of ruin. So she went to the root of the problem, literally. To empower local women and to help restore the environment, she started the Green Belt Movement, which taught Kenyan women to nurture and then plant trees to replace the ones that were being cut down. She showed them how to find seeds for the trees, to grow seedlings from those seeds, and to plant and care for the trees. Together, they created tree nurseries, and the women earned money doing that work. They gained job skills and helped the environment. More trees meant less soil erosion, and that meant cleaner water. The Green Belt Movement grew way beyond Wangari's expectations. It began with a few women planting trees, and by 2004, more than 30 million trees had been planted by hundreds of women's groups across Kenya. The Green Belt Movement also encouraged people to register to vote, to speak out for their rights and for the environment, and to press for political reform. Over the years, Wangari won many national, international awards from organizations that recognized her efforts for peace and for political reform. But on several occasions, her own government didn't see things quite that way. She was beaten, she was arrested, and she was often dismissed as crazy. In spite of everything, she never backed down. And in 2004, Wangari Mathai made history by being the first environmentalist and the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Wangari's legacy shows that the future is God's, but we share in the responsibility to unfold that future. We can never be sure of the end results when we plant seeds of hope and peace. We water them and try to fertilize the soil, knowing that the germination process takes place in the dark grounds of God's mysterious work. Sophie Scholl was 12 years old in 1933 when she joined the League of German Girls, which was the girls' branch of the Nazi party. Like many young people, 
like many Germans, especially young people, Sophie had no idea, really, the evils that the Nazi party was doing. She didn't yet know about the cruel things. But when she went to university, she and her brother Hans began to learn much about what they were actually doing. They read reports of the mass killings of Jewish people and atrocities committed in other countries. They also read philosophers about, who wrote about civil disobedience and the importance of acting upon your conscience. Sophie, Hans, and their friends had to be very secretive about their conversations. But the more they talked and read, the more they learned, they knew that they had to act. The group called themselves the White Rose, and in 1942, they wrote an anonymous essay criticizing the Nazis. They made hundreds of copies, and Sophie bravely scattered the leaflets all over her university so that students and teachers would find them. We will not be silent became their unofficial motto. On February 18, 1943, Sophie and Hans were distributing their sixth, their sixth leaflet. They still had flyers when the bell rang, and Sophie didn't want to waste them, so she ran to the, stop of the top of a stairwell and scattered the leaflets down for students to pick them up. But a, a caretaker saw them and turned them in. They were arrested and interrogated. They confessed and took full responsibility refusing to name any other White Rose members. But in spite of that, several other members were also arrested. They were all charged with treason and sentenced to death. Sophie was 21 years old. Sophie was calm throughout her entire trial. Somebody, after all, had to make a start, Sophie said to the Nazi judge. Sophie held her head high and, de and defended her peaceful actions, proclaiming, I did the best I could for my nation, and therefore I am not ashamed of what I did, and I will accept the consequences. Sophie and the White Rose became famous for their immense courage and commitment to peaceful resistance against tyranny. Sophie made the statement, what we did will cause waves. Even though her life was taken so young, her legacy continues to inspire people to, to stand in a peaceful effort against evil of all kinds. These women I've lifted up today at our special celebration of Women's History Month serve as witnesses for what can be accomplished when you decide, just like the gardener in Jesus' parable, that you want your life to be spent nurturing seeds of hope inclusion, justice, and peace. With God's help, the fruit of your efforts will grow beyond your wildest imagination. Keep tilling the soil where you stand and cultivate love, inclusion, and generosity of spirit. I have no doubt that your persistent efforts will make waves, and waves cause ripples farther than we have the ability to see. We may not become famous or win a Nobel Peace Prize, but God can use us right here, right where we are. Our God who created everything from the smell of orange blossoms to the great galaxies full of stars and planets to our own beating hearts will infuse our offerings of love. In this world with divine energy, which will make them spread and flourish. Amen. Amen. Our Mother, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Give up.
us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil